Занимаем места. Please take your seats. Our session is beginning. Colleagues in the front row, let's begin. Our session is called From My Street to My Neighborhood. And it's dedicated to the evolution and development of our environment in Moscow, and of a good environment in Moscow. We're going to be discussing this with experts together with Peter Biryukov, who's the deputy mayor of Moscow for housing and communal services and improvement. Mr. Biryukov will join us in a few minutes. Allow me to introduce the participants today in today's discussion. Let's start from left to right. Carlo Castelli, who is the head of City Solutions, Jacobs. Let's applaud our guest from Scotland. Then we have Mark Williams, who is the director of LDA Design from London. Mark, we're applauding. Ms. Dominique Alba, who is the main director of APUR, that's the Agence Parisienne de l'Urbanisme and Parisian Urbanism Agency, similar to the Russian Genplan. Let's applaud Dominique. And we have Ms. Michelle Larouche-Chalou, who is the head of the Bordeaux Metropole Mission 2050. This is a strategy for the development of Bordeaux in the period up to 2050. We also have our Moscow colleagues, Alex Shapiro, who is the co-founder of uh, the founder of the company Wow House, and then we have um, Grigory Rizvin, who is a partner at KB Strelka and an architecture critic. Let's talk about how we're going to be organizing our session. We're we're very very proud that our session is one of the top five most interesting ones here at MUF. We've heard this based on RBK's. Uh, publish publications, and I would like to uh, really prove that they were right. We're going to talk on our topical issues, we're going to be laconic, and we're get going to get to the point. The main topic of today's discussion is how to improve the uh, Moscow neighborhood environment. These neighborhoods we're talking about are 3 to 4 percent of built areas in Moscow. My Street, that's a very successful program that we all participated in. We're all very proud of it. We focused mainly on the center and on the highways around the center. Right now, we're talking about these suburbs, and we're going to be improving the environment in micro neighborhoods, micro regions, micro districts. That's what we're talking about, My Street. What approaches can we take? Let's talk about this now. While we're waiting for Mr. Biryukov, allow me to give the floor to Ms. Michelle Larouchalou from the city of Bordeaux. This is a, a city that's undergone a large change over the past 20 years. It's developed a lot. We'd like to hear a bit about your experience and how we could possibly apply it in this program, My Neighborhood, so that we can improve the environment here in the Moscow periphery. Thank you. I'm very glad to be participating in this panel here. So I'm going to try to tell you in five minutes about this experience. That'll be a little difficult. What we can say, broadly speaking, is that we've had a deep change over the past 20 years in Bordeaux. What is its particular aspect? It's uh, an, not just an economic project. It's not just a, not a cultural project like Bilbao. This is an urban project. It's a coherent project based on a few objectives that we had. One of them is uh, equal territory, so we're fighting against the asymmetry of uh, land distribution, territorial distribution. We have a number of tools in order to localize this project. We have uh, main uh, tools, that's mobility, which can be a complex issue. Then we also have the installation of tramways. This helped us to uh, free up public spaces. 
This allowed us to free up peripheral areas. There's public spaces there now which allow us to communicate with other people, to meet other people, to relax and have fun. And then our final tool is the um, patrimony and the cultural heritage, our national heritage. I think that w when it comes to our idea, we don't think about separate difficult neighborhoods. We're treating them as normal neighborhoods. That's, that's enough to begin with, I think. Well, you know, Конкретизация, что значит вот работать с этими трудными кварталами, как с нормальными кварталами? Применимы ли при работе с этими кварталами те схемы, которые обычно присутствуют при работе с более центральными? Uh, no, of course, of course there's a lot of uh, neighborhoods that have um, their own characteristics. There's periphery and then they have a strong cultural character as well. When we're talking about different neighborhoods we call normal neighborhoods, then um, what we mean is they have to be accessible when we're talking about mobility. We mustn't think about them as social neighborhoods. We have to build uh, housing for the middle class, not just for the most uh, underprivileged parts of the population. We need to build housing for everyone. That's uh, another complex issue here. We also need cultural sports centers, social centers. We need to be able to mix people in these areas. And the best way to do that is to build a lot of housing and to improve public spaces. Thank you very much, Michelle. I think that the main point here is really the diversity, which is the main positive aspect of city development. Let's applaud Mr. Biryukov, who has joined us. Mr. Biryukov, uh, I've already given my introduction. Right now, we're talking about how we can move from my street to my neighborhood and uh, what experience can be used here, what's in demand, what's new. We would very much like to hear your presentation. Tell us, please. Good afternoon, colleagues. I ask you to forgive my tardiness. This program, my street and the previous programs that had to do with the improvement of uh, roads are parts of the program My Neighborhood. Let's talk about our achievements. We have to say that uh, in this program over the past few years, we've really done a lot of work. We have 23,000 Moscow uh, roads that we've improved. We have approximately 350 new parks. In the city, we have around 600 parks, but before we had about 130 organized park areas. We're also talking about the fact that since 2014, my decision of the mayor, we have been working on um, this program, My Street. And we've uh, built over 350 streets. We've improved over 350 streets. This is a lot of area in the, um, in the city. It's approximately 100 uh, kilometers in length. This is not just the central part of the uh, city. It's not just Arbat or Tverskaya Street. We're talking about highways as well in Leningradsky Prospect, Yaroslavsky Highway. Uh, Varshavsky Highway as well. These are new areas that we've worked on in the city. What do we need to do in the future? Over the next few years, we are going to be organizing work to improve comfortable areas in the city, not just centrally, but everywhere. The city has to be a city of equal opportunities everywhere. And so we've been developing our program. We have also consulted with Muscovites. We've met with them personally. We received proposals and and their opinions. And the city has decided to start working in these suburbs and in the periphery. Each neighborhood will have their own master plan. But now Muscovites have proposed, and we are working on this. We are now 
working in different areas based on proposals from Moscovites. We have to note that in 2019, we're going to be doing large-scale and smaller-scale work. This will be approximately 1,000 um, uh, 1,100 area uh, places, locations. So this means improvement of the area. This means um, cement and asphalt that we'll be updating. This means improvement work from house to house. It's the same work we've been doing. We're doing engineering work. We're doing renovation work for facades of buildings. We're creating sports uh, areas, sports facilities, playgrounds. Something else that's important is approximately 255 global and large-scale uh, locations that we will be uh, that we will be updating in the uh, city. There's fi 53 in the My Street program. We've also got administrative regions where we'll be working on park territories. That's approximately nine uh, objects, nine places, nine urban forests, as well. Um, uh, several uh, our agricultural areas. This will also be part of our improvement programs for different neighborhoods. This is a very complex goal, but we can do it. So what have we managed to do in the city system? What are we doing? We're making our city comfortable. We've been discussing improvement issues in, around the uh, Moscow embankment. We took a look at plans for main streets, parallel streets. We've created pedestrian areas. We've been working on the Moscow River area. We used to have 10 kilometers of uh, the Moscow embankment that we need to improve. Uh, right now we've got only um, 50 we've got 55 kilometers that we've improved. We're working on different locations. Our pedestrian areas are helping us to improve uh, different regions as well, different neighborhoods. We've got a lot of uh, public spaces where you can meet up, where you can have festivals, you can have markets, you can have events. We have approximately seven to eight festivals that can be carried out at each of these spaces. And we've seen that we have more tourists now as well in Moscow. This doesn't just mean that it was tourists after the World Cup. We're talking about general tourists as well. Every day we have more and more tourists. Our park areas are now accessible both in the winter and in the summer. It's available at any time, accessible at any time. Our parks are free and accessible for visitors. Our parks have comfortable areas for people to rest. In our central parks, you can have areas where you can walk with your child, where you can go out for walks with your dogs, for example. And this is all part of our program, My Street. And we're turning this program now into a new program called My Neighborhood. So what, how is this program different? It's a holistic approach to the issue. If we're talking about our program, My Street, then this was more of a linear program. But for my neighborhood, this is a more comprehensive approach. For example, the neighborhood of Kapotnia. We're also improving different neighborhoods and uh, districts on the southwest of the city, 50 to 90 hectares. The uh, southwest, for example, all administrative districts are organizing this program as well and implementing it. Let's talk about this work, my street. Together with improvement, we've also been discussing, and this is based on the desires of Muscovites, the expansion and systematization of the street system. This means that we have uh, new, new roads for public transportation, for buses. We're also improving the areas near metro stations. We're also improving pedestrian pathways. We're increasing pedestrian pathways around metro stations, also transport hubs. We're solving the issue of um, incomplete buildings, incomplete construction sites. For example, there are a lot of parking lots that had that were begun but were never finished. We don't need these parking lots. We can put something else there. The 
mayor is making these decisions and we are implementing them and building sports complex so complexes so that Muscovites can feel comfortable in their own city. We're also developing preschool um, institutions. And I would like to also note our sports facilities. Right now, we don't really have uh, enough cultural uh, centers and uh, healthcare centers. We're working on a renovation of these areas. We're talking to investors. We're creating cultural areas, um, educational centers that people can go to depending on where they live. So they'll have one in their neighborhood. This is a large scale task, of course, and we're planning it out over the next five years, starting from 2019, we will be working on it. By the end of these five years, we should have an entirely adapted city, but we should also not forget that we need to upkeep this. We need to keep improving our city. We need to keep developing our city. This will be systematic work. The more we have, uh, the more new objects we have in the city, the more requests there will be from Muscovites to improve and make their city more comfortable. This is logical. This is the way things should be. The next aspect we can discuss, yesterday at the plenary, we mentioned the concept of a healthy city. Now we have a program called Moscow Longevity and all architects and designers and sociologists that work along this area of work um, worldwide are telling us that Moscow is actually in a leading position when it comes to this issue. We have managed to make spaces available for people to walk by foot in a secure, safe environment so that they can play sports outside, so that they can use their bicycles outside, so that year-round we have parks that are being used in the winter for skis, for example, for hockey, for um, ice skating and speed skating, and in the summer they can use they can play summer sports. We've created all of the necessary uh, services and conditions. We're talking about security, we're talking about uh, medical care, and this way all Muscovites are taking part in this. They're improving their health. And this is a topic that we're discussing right now, and it's um, parallel to all of our decisions. But we also could ask, who is doing this? How are they doing it? What are they implementing? In the beginning, we had three uh, design uh, project designing institutes. Now we have uh, approximately 20 projects. We have uh, over that amount of designer institutes and uh, working groups that are working on improving our city. We have our own specialists. We have foreign specialists. Many of them are present here today. We are very grateful to them for our ability now to create a Russian school of architecture and design. We're very grateful. We'll start from Moscow. We've got programs of development for our city environment. And from this, we've moved on to the development of the entirety of Russia. Each district now is trying to make their own main streets, the analogs, uh, the, um, for example, uh, along the same principles of Tverskaya Street, Nikolskaya Street. You don't have to uh, have a World Cup in your city, but what you need is comfortable streets, a comfortable city. So now, on the improvement of territory and the implementation of city programs together with renovation of our housing uh, foundation as well, our housing basis, we have approximately 80,000 people working on all of this every day. We've managed to improve our national industry as well. We have a new lighting fixtures that we're producing. We're creating entirely new uh, prepared elements for construction, for transport construction as well, roads, road building. We've got our new standards for improvements. Before we had approximately 250 um, lamps outside, for example, and light fixtures, and now we're improving this. We're taking into account standards in our historical parts of the city. Something else that's very important and I want to underline, before we can start improving uh, our 
city, we need to work on improving our engineering. We're renovating. We're improving our engineering system in order to, over the next 40 years, we could just keep moving forward. We don't have to go back and, and repair anything. We also have uh, city industries, uh, city enterprises, and companies that have been created to streamline this process. They're working quite well, and I must say that our complex city um, enterprises are now considered quite large scale, even on a global level, and they are very efficient in helping us solve our issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Birikov. Could I ask you a couple of questions? One of them will be about my neighborhood, one of them will be about my street. Regarding my neighborhood, everyone is, of course, very interested in this image of the future of the Moscow neighborhood. What will it look like in 2025? Could you please let us know? Do you have any already prepared spaces outside of the uh, Sadova ring, the garden ring? something that we can uh, strive towards when we're improving our micro districts. Well, regarding this question, I can give you an example. That's Hamovniki, the district. Five years ago, please remember what it looked like. We were improving the Frunzinskai embankment, also Komsamoski prospect. Two years ago, before the World Cup, we started working on the embankment near Luzhniki Stadium, for example. And before the beginning of the World Cup, we went from Luzhniki to the Garden Ring. And we improved all of the transport hubs and connections there. But that's not enough. We didn't really think about what don't we have enough of here. We don't have enough preschools, schools, sports complexes, gyms. We'll add that. The next issue we looked at was um, we need to talk about buildings that haven't yet been completed. We need to work on public transportation. And these elements are the ones that we will include in our single concepts that we're developing now for a master plan, which, will, which is what Muscovites want. And this is the entire city system that's working on this, not just enterprises, but other organs as well. Uh, also, this is a work by constructors, by the social sphere, and also our transport people. Uh, we also started the issues of safety and security, me medical care. All the spheres are developing this issue so far. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Biryukov. There is one question concerning one of the most significant uh, facilities of my street, which was uh, for, uh, awarded by a move, uh, Kachlovska Square. We know that uh, uh, there is some repayment over there, and we uh, get a lot of questions and for, from uh, uh, urbanist people, from uh, the public. So uh, could you comment on it, and how? Well, all the, t uh, all the time uh, we, were, uh, we live in noise, unfortunately. Uh, there's been no one facility when we could just press the button and these uh, things are ready. So we certainly listen to different points of view. Uh, we make a concept and then we come, as you know, to different areas and start working with you. But there is one advantage of us working on the program My Street, which is now called My Region before uh, the construction, uh, archaeologists start working, so more than 30,000 artifacts uh, have been uh, founded so far, so we can see uh, what the previous generations of Moscovites did, how they lived, how they worked, and uh, in the streets we uh, have uh, several dozens of museums in the open space. Khachlovska Square is one of them. Muscovites asked us to make Kachlovska square uh, to improve it. Spasa Galinishevska square uh, is another project uh, where uh, people were involved. So for two years we did it together. So this is one of uh, beloved uh, places there. Yes, everything started with noise and discomfort, but they like the place so far. Hachlovska Square is the same thing. We just, uh, to overcome this uh, 
time. Let us uh, try to survive. Uh, certainly, violation of uh, social behavior is uh, bad. But it is museum. This is our history. And this should be understood. Well, people are different. Uh, we uh, create comfortable environment in the city, and we bring up uh, Moscovites. So remember, 10 uh, years ago, uh, we went to the crossings and uh, we went along the streets. We saw a, long of, a lot of pieces of uh, paper, a lot of rubbish everywhere. Now, can you uh, look around and see how clean uh, the city is? And uh, however, uh, we try uh, to make our city clean. We'll never do it if everyone throws away the rubbish. Uh, the same way uh, concerns Hachlovska Square. No one closes it. We just did it for several days for preventive war jobs. This is just pure prevention. But providing the fact this is a special attention facility, and providing that we need to discuss uh, together with the citizens how this kind of facility leaves our colleagues, uh, headed by uh, Daria Paramonova, chief of Strelka, uh, has prepared a notice for uh, the architecture of Haklovska uh, Square. Thank you so much. It's so good. We have this kind of recommendations. Uh, production is as follows. Any production plant is created and there are instructions so uh, later conducting this kind of jobs uh, will demand from the project team for instructions how uh, the uh, square or street should be uh, used so far I would like to give the floor to Grigory Ryevsin partner of Strelka, Piotr Birikov, and our French colleague, has said already how important it is to have the centrals for culture and social life in cities and towns. Grigori, you've conducted a survey on the architecture of peripheral areas in the year 2013, ordered by the Moscow Urban Forum. And there, you were responsible for culture, and you uh, assessed uh, the uh, cultural life of uh, those regions. What kind of development of these uh, places would you introduce uh, as part of the project My Area, My Region? How to underline the identity on the one hand and uh, on the other hand, how to create some uh, place for social life there? Well, thank you so much. Five years ago, when we started that uh, project, Archaeology of Peripheral areas, the idea there was as follows. All those areas are equally tense concerning lifestyle, and they were meant to be similar, similarly ex uh, accessible and similarly developing. Well, that was uh, how it was planned in those times. but. Were there any changes? Well, some natural things, landscapes, uh, some lakes, some rivers, oh, and uh, probably memorials. That was probably not enough for creating uh, regions' identities. The, speaking about the cultural centers, and these are cinemas, clubs, uh, recreation uh, facilities, which for some reason were on the outskirts. It's too little to define this mile of, uh, from Butova, these two regions. More or less, they were the same. So the mere idea to settle the issues of centralization and identity, cr creating unique cultural facilities, looked for me, uh, well, quite ambitious, but uh, I, what, of little perspective. It doesn't work. So what idea did we have five years ago? 
Yes, uh, the uh, areas uh, were to be the same, but uh, people uh, had lived there for five years uh, and the areas developed differently. So we figured out several centers where uh, uh, functions uh, were increasing for some region. Ismailova, Sokol, Pravsayuzna suddenly were uh, more or less the same concerning development. Belaruska, Taganska is another group absolutely similar. Uh, these areas became kind of central points uh, comparing to other ones, Marina and Darekhova Borisova, they are more or less the same, but uh, they are not uh, centered. That was the idea. Let us push these places of crystallization in the city. Uh, and uh, thus we'll get polycentricity. And around these uh, self-created centers, uh, people will get in Moscow. So that didn't have any sense, uh, probably, uh, for many people. But we wanted to make these areas kind of centers uh, to add some new central features to these areas. The dormitory areas uh, have some problems, and uh, this problem hasn't been uh, solved anywhere in the world, how to include these uh, polycentric issues. Well, uh, these areas develop. Uh, but uh, let's uh, see how the central areas of uh, any cities. Uh, it's easy. Uh, there are good examples in Paris, Berlin, uh, in Algeria, in Tunisia. But how should we deal with the dormitory areas? Uh, there is no experience, though it's interesting. Five years ago, we thought that we needed to create uh, something like center in this uh, naturally natural uh, special areas. Uh, now I think we need to have a different approach when we want to make uh, uh, well the ground floor in uh, uh, in. Um, um, multi-storied buildings, it doesn't work. When we want to have new highways and there are no functions there, the streets, uh, well, they don't live actually, nothing happens there. When we create pedestrian areas uh, like we do in the center, the, it doesn't work. There are no people there. So today, I think I believe that any region and any district should be d dealt with just like a city. So any district in Moscow features about 100,000 people. This is the size of a more or less small city or town. Thus, we believe that we should deal with this particular district like as if it were a city, as if it had its periphery, its downtown etc etc how to do this kind of a master plan is an open issue actually because we just haven't found yet the solution to this problem this kind of master plans should be based on different values different to those that are in the normal city downtowns because the quality is not the same we should create a bit different values uh, the improved kind of values. For example, dormitory areas are an epitome of not hierarchy in a contrast to the center, but the epitome of equilibrium and equality. This is what we're talking about dormitory areas. So this is a great value, especially today. Another thing is a healthy lifestyle. Parks, walking, jogging, etc., etc., is another important issue for our day to day lives. Children is another issue of top importance. 
Looking at the infographics, looking at different pictures, we get the information on, on the schools, children playing on the school playgrounds. And uh, looking back at the history of any particular district, we understand that although the infrastructure might be the same with the city center or with other districts, but in this particular district, children are prospering, they have fun playing on the playing grounds, and so on and so forth. And last but not least comes the idea of the future, its image. These dormitory areas are the image of the past, and probably this crisis stems from the idea that the dormitory areas reflect the way life was 50 years ago. Now the point is we should focus on the future. Big offices in the downtowns and city centers, they should be left in the past. Now, the main idea of a work of an office should be that it should be moved to the dormitory areas or at least closer to the places where people live. This might be the trend for the coming 20 years dealing with trade and small shops that are just next to the houses where people live. They should move to the dormitory area because this big chains of supermarkets, they just do not let them function in city centers. So these master plans should feature on the one hand the values that they used to comprise and that are partly lost but on the other hand, the values of the future, of the, so to say, Moscow 2035. So it will be the master plan of a new city that can interact with other master plans, other cities and other districts. Thank you, Grigory, for the very meaningful presentation. You know, I only have one short question that requires a brief answer, actually. You talked about equality. Michel Larue Charlou talked about the fact that the most important thing is social diversity. So the issue of diversity is at a certain point confronted with the paradigm of equality. Do you see the risk of ghettoization of the dormitory areas in Moscow? Or there is already this social diversity as a historical factor, so to say? Well, I believe that Bordeaux districts are very much different from our dormitory areas and the social and national and ethnic diversification is much more increased there, much more pronounced. We, in contrast, have much more uh, homogene structure of our citizens because I don't believe there can be Muslim quarters, Muslim areas or areas belonging to people of other religions or ethnic minorities. Although diversity, cultural diversity is of importance, I believe that equality is a top priority. If you want diversity you could go to the downtown, you know. If you want this equality it should be in the dormitory area. Policymakers, I believe, should be able to combine all those things. Communists at the periphery and the liberals in the city center. Uh, I would like to give the floor to Dominique Alba. Grigori said that in Paris nothing can be done with the dormitory areas. Uh, the HLM so to say, as they say in French, uh, districts. Because this is a really bad situation. They've got a lot of uh, such regions in Paris. Ah, in français or in anglais? Comme vous voulez. <laughs> okay, I do it in English. I think it's easier now. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Mm. We have in Paris uh, quite a situation. It's not like Moscow, but it's not so different. We have the same history in our cities. And now, uh, about this question of 
we, we don't never call them dormitory cities. Uh, it's the social housing. And the new metro line that's now starting to be built, uh, his principal role is to connect the main, pa main part of those territories where we have social housing to improve the access to employee and to services. So that means that we can't imagine we are going to take the people and put them in another place or take the offices and put them in another place. We have a huge amount of existing square meters and our first job is perhaps to try to go out with this heritage. So the first thing is the metro just to connect and give more facilities to each situation to be connected with the others. And on the other hand, because I know my time to speak is very short, so I will not explain everything. Perhaps an example, thinking about uh, what was saying the mayor of Moscow this morning about uh, the desire of people and uh, what they need. And now we just uh, are able um, to directly involve the people in doing things. That means that when you start with a public space, for example, or with streets, you have two solutions. You can take an architect, an engineer, and you design things, and it will take five, six, seven years, ten years. Or you have another possibility, say you just take people with you, create a small box inside the public space, the existing situation, and say, OK, now we're going to change it together. And you consider that this change is a project and has a value. And now uh, Anne Hidalgo will open, uh, I think it's Sunday, in Paris. A great change was made like that in Place de la Nation. So it's not a chicka thing. It's a huge public space that was transformed with the people. And the demolition was made with the people. The plantations were made with the people and the animation is made by the people. Architects are there just to help, but that means that when you want to change social housing, it's just to give possibilities to everybody to be an actor of the situation. You need to do renovation, you need to do services, all cities do that. But also, you need to give the dream to the people and the dream, you can give it to them while allowing them just to transform also the space. Uh, Michel, Michel, thank you very much. Just one little question to you. I can say I absolutely agree with Grigori that there are no good, vivid examples of working with social housing, we know the Locatal Bureau uh, and Roland Castro and Philippe Panere projects. We know all these examples. Can you tell us what regions of mass social housing you would advise our colleagues in the Greater Paris to visit in order to see a vivid example of innovation, modernization and redevelopment of such kind of districts? Yes, sir. Um, we have, um, depends what you're looking for, you have all the possibilities. We have um, a thing that's common between Paris and Bordeaux, La Caton Vassal, that uh, made transformation on buildings of the 60s by extension. So the dormitory buildings now look like residential building. It's just something, and it, they had a price in uh, the Miss van der Rohe Prize, a European level price. You can go to Clichy Montfermeil. Everybody knows, heard about this because we had dramatic things 10 years ago in that place. And now you have a, a new building for culture made with the people. That's very, very incredible thing. And you can go also in some spaces in Paris, I say Place de la Nation or Place du Panthéon, just to see how you do things differently. And if you look at them, you could think that it's not possible to do that without changing the ways of doing things.
No, it's not a question of money. It's not a question of rules. It's not a question of um, um, capacity. It's just a question of new conversation between the people and between the urban situations. Thank you very much, Michel. So I would like to give the floor to our colleagues, uh, Carla Castelli, the head of the urban design uh, division of Jacobs Company. You're working in Scotland. We know that in Scotland there are these massives of social housing of modernized block of flats, especially in Glasgow. And uh, we know great examples of quarters such as retro apartment, for instance, that were demolished in 2015 and there was formed a new environment of uh, block of flats. Do you believe that such kind of areas should be demolished or maybe they should be redeveloped better in a more efficient way? Probably the answer is it depends um, on a case by case basis. Um, I, I live and work in London um, and uh, we've been doing this uh, interesting work in, uh, in Edinburgh uh, for the last year or so. Um, but I would like to, um, uh, just going to go quickly through some slides. I don't know if we go to the next one. Um, I think we live in extraordinary times, really. Uh, and we heard today and yesterday uh, fantastic words from the, from the mayor, from uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Biyukov today, about uh, the fact that uh, you know, making our cities comfortable is logical. I mean, 20 years ago, this was not uh, you know, on the agenda at all. Um, you know, we have a global urban trends that actually kind of really uh, give us a, a really interesting picture of, of the world from an urban point of view. Um, you know, the, the world is uh, as urban as ever before. Uh, it will be even more urban in a, in, a, in a 25 years time, but it's also a highly unequal uh, world. Uh, so we heard today uh, both uh, Michelle and uh, um, <clears throat> Gregory kind of talking about the fact that we need, we need to, to kind of rebalance, you know, fight, fighting the asymmetry, uh, making, you know, uh, aiming at relaxing spaces and, uh, you know, uplifting the heritage. So just uh, to kind of touch on, uh, on uh, uh, Edinburgh, you know, nowadays uh, as part of this kind of uh, global picture, cities are collaborating and competing as, uh, as ever before. That's another kind of global trend. Uh, we are all together here in Moscow in this fantastic forum and uh, you know, we are exchanging ideas just because cities are actually trying to attract talents, attract innovation, attract people to kind of live there. And that's why, just to remind ourselves why quality of life and well-being are so important today. So it's, a, it's certainly a moral obligation from an equity point of view, but also because in a, in a highly competitive environment for cities, and Moscow is at the forefront for this, uh, it's quite important to, to get it right. Uh, in Edinburgh, the problem was that uh, the city was victim of uh, its success, really. Uh, tourism trends are incredibly successful in the last 10 years. They, they're growing. The city centre is overheated, so they wanted to kind of look at the city itself. They've done a lot of work recent, in recent years for a Vision 2050, mobility plans, uh, integration plans, but we, they wanted to kind of go they were struggling a little bit to kind of see this change implemented. So they, you know, we, we went in with a, actually kind of big group uh, of partners. And uh, I think nowadays collaboration is a key factor. We can't do it uh, ourselves only. You know, we need partners and collaboration to really kind of achieve success and, in, and enhance outcomes. And really, in a short um, uh, sentence, I would say Edinburgh City Centre Transformation Plan is about putting people first uh, and using data, uh, really kind of heavy data, to uh, put the vision into implementation. So that's what we were called in. Um, the interesting thing was that, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> the, 
the collaborative approach was not only you know amongst the team but also you know with the city with the funding partners the councils and, and all the actors and the, the constituents we had these fantastic thematic uh, workshops and we heard here in Moscow, the mayor talking both yesterday and today about listening really to the, to the residents' uh, uh, needs and expectations and taking those into the vision. So three elements that, uh, to me, in, my, in, this, in our discussion today uh, were very, very strong. One is a scalable, integrated methodology. So to, to go back to your question, you know, we really need to look at sort of residential developments, existing residential developments in their own complexity. Uh, and from my point of view, for instance, the Bill Mamiya uh, quarter in Amsterdam is a very interesting example of how taking a monofunctional residential quarter, uh, very deprived at the time, and taking it to a very successful uh, um, district at the moment. Um, and this scalable integrated methodology is that in my view, you can't really kind of look at sort of the district, the street, or the, or the region. You really need to kind of take all these scales, all these dimensions, all together at the same time. And that's what, you know, uh, it's challenging at the moment. We need to really embrace complexity and use all sorts of disciplines. We can't be an architect anymore. We can't be an economist anymore, or we can't be a sociologist. We need to be city makers and uh, really kind of think in an integrated way. The other one is value, and it was touched upon before. Again, just on residential developments, it re we really need to understand in terms of cost benefits, whether it makes sense to demolish, and sometimes it does, or, or sometimes it, it makes sense to, to renovate. But the creation of value that we, go, we, we achieve through the, the public space and the quality of life, the well-being characters of our cities can be and should be reallocated in a public-private logic into the equation. So we can't really uh, uh, think about the, these operations and the processes in, in purely financial terms. And the last one, again touched upon today, I really think that the center-periphery dichotomy uh, is not uh, helpful anymore. Uh, I think nowadays, I, mean, I live in London, which is a, a you know, probably one of the most polycentric cities in the world, uh, very successfully uh, achieved probably over organic growth, not so much from a planning point, but not, not so much, no, it's not true. Actually, the Abercrombie plan uh, really was based on uh, this city of cities. Um, but yeah, we need to, because infrastructure and transportation connectivity that Dominic was referring to, uh, not only at the metro system level, but also second and third tier, you know, bus networks, you know, and kind of, you know, uh, bus transit or, or cycling and walking could be really the way to integrate our cities and kind of supersede completely the centre periphery. In London, it is now acceptable that you commute for two hours choosing to do so because you, it's about choosing what space you want to live in. So residential and dormitory, so-called dormitory quarters, can be an invaluable asset uh, asset for London, for, for Moscow, sorry, because you can rethink the city, and, and Moscow is already doing it. Uh, you know, I, I was, I'm always, you know, this is my fifth or sixth time in Moscow in the last 10 years, and I'm really surprised and pleased about the, the, the success. Yeah. So, those three elements. Спасибо большое, Карла. Карло, thank you very much. Applause to our speaker. Do I get it right that you believe that in dormitory areas we can create, due to this integrated and holistic approach, real centers of social life? Personal experience, well, not only professional, but also from an academic point of view. Uh, ten years ago, I went back to university. I kind of did this studies program at the London School of Economics, and my dissertation actually was about. Uh, residential developments, and odd enough, or interesting enough, in London, residential developments are incredibly successful for the residential component, but the developers really struggle with a non-residential component. And there's a number of uh, factors that really contribute to this. Is the design, you know, the, the typical floor plate is optimized for residential uses and not so much for commercial or other uses. Uh, the limitation, the concept of mixed use, we need to really kind of rethink completely the, the mix use, the mixite uh, concept. We need to think about bringing back manufacturing. We need to bring back you know other uses. You know, uh, 
Um, so the complexity and, and the embracing all these kind of various aspects in residential development to be transformed into social life, uh, including the fact that we think normally horizontally, so it's the ground floor that we normally think about as a kind of an active space. Actually, we should be really, particularly for high-rise or mid-rise buildings, we should think about the, the, the building options in their own entirety. So mm -hmm. top floors for observation, for social life, uh, for gardens, and there are many, many examples in the world nowadays. Mm. Mark Williams, Mark Williams is another our guest from London. LD Design Park Culture Concept is uh, one of the experiences of his activities, and now he's taking part in Serb and Molot project. Can you comment on what we are discussing on our uh, on our discussion from the point of view of your experience, international and national? Echoing Carlos's comments that in London, um, Belize in microphone. Is that better? Yeah, yeah good. Um, I would echo Carlos's comments that in London the polycentric model is actually working very well. Um, the artist and architect Cedric Price once said that London has evolved like an egg and that historically it was a boiled egg whereby the, the centre was fixed and very solid but surrounded by a greenbelt that contained it. So we've got very strict greenbelt policy. It then morphed in the 80s into more of a fried egg and the center started to move out into the, the peripheries following transport corridors. And now we've arrived at a situation where it's almost like a scrambled egg. And the polycentric model works incredibly well. Um, and as, as you said, Carlos Abercrombie, he foresaw that you know, almost 100 years ago. So uh, a plan was drawn that started to guide the growth of London uh, thinking about a constellation of villages clustered around the centre of London. So it works very well, but we are no doubt facing the same challenges that you are here in Moscow. So London is growing by a thousand people per year. The population is increasing by a hundred thousand per year. Um, that means it's getting denser, it's getting hotter, more congested, more polluted. Um, I'm pleased to be sat next to Dominique, who I think yesterday was on the NLA panel for us and voted us the winners of an LA, NLA award, um, which was our work in the West End of London. So we looked at um, transforming the highways infrastructure between Euston Road and Tottenham Court Road to start to remove a one-way system and start to humanise the streets in between those two points. And what it's done is it's freed up the environment around the British Museum, um, it's allowed us to calm the traffic in that area, but also to develop seven new parks in the heart of London. Um, what we've also learned is that um, the mayor policy in London has been very supportive in terms of creating places for people. So by 2041, the mayor wants to achieve 80% of trips in the city by walking, cycling and public transport. So quite an aspirational target there. Um, but also a key part of his strategy is to make sure that all Londoners are doing 20 minutes of active travel every day. So it's supporting health and well-being as well. Um, thinking about how that sort of addresses some of the points about how we transform the city centre, but how we start to address quality of life in the, the periphery dormitories is an interesting point. We have been working on a, a, a social housing estate in North London, um, and there are some astonishing, very sad statistics about some of our social housing estates in London. Um, the estate we're working on in Haringey, there's an eight-year life expectancy gap between people that live in the estate and live the other side of the road. So that's purely because of the, the physical environment they're living in. And when we start projects like that, we like to completely transform the order of thinking. It's not about architecture. It's not about infrastructure. It's actually thinking about people. Uh, and what we always say is that, you know, we have two ears and one mouth for a reason, and perhaps as designers, and, and influences in the urban environment. Maybe we, we talk too much, and we should probably listen twice as much as we talk. So when we're working in those communities, we like to start at the beginning by listening to what they're saying, what they're asking for. Um, the other thing I think that's interesting in our dormitories is the way that we distribute in London density. So we have a system called the, the PTAL rating, which is about public, public transport accessibility. 
and that allows us to determine where certain peripheral areas of the city can accommodate greater density in a mix of uses. So, uh, yeah, just to sum that up, I think you asked us to cut to the chase at the beginning. I would say let's start thinking about people first at the beginning of the process. Um, view our dormitory areas as big opportunities to create places that can be complementary to the city centre. Thank you very much, Mark. I have just one question. You say that in this downtown of London, 80% 80 uh, 80 of transportation should be by walking or by cycling. Is this solution or can this solution can be implemented in dormitory areas? We're, we're very fortunate that we um, have some very strong green infrastructure corridors that take you in and out of the city. So it's definitely more common now that um, on a mor every morning commuters you see running along the Thames, for example. So rivers and pieces of green infrastructure are amazing. Um, they're the veins of the city that bring life into the city centre. And I think in London there's certainly a trend where people will run and cycle along those corridors for quite long distances. Um, it's certainly a challenge. It needs investment in high quality public transport as well. Um, we're committed to Crossrail, which should be open next year. Fingers crossed it, it keeps getting delayed. But um, that will take people within 15 minutes from um, the west of London right the way into the heart of London without needing to change trains at all. Um, so I think it's a combination of um, making it a preference to cycle and walk, making it as efficient as possible, but also giving uh, an attractive alternative with the public transport. Thank you, Mark. Alec Shapira is dealing with projects in the Gorky Park, but I believe he's got other projects and ideas for future projects in dormitory areas. So I will show you some slides. So we have the city center, the Moscow city center, Nikolskaya Street, with a quite active lifestyle there. And the periphery, about 9.8 9 percent of the territory of Moscow. We have to do something with that. It's probably unlike Glasgow. And this is great that we have all my colleagues here talking about London and Paris. I believe and the more alternative centers we will be able to do, the better it is because there were a constellation of cities that were around uh, the city of London, and in the case of Moscow, it was more about villages that were built as massive block of flats. What can we do with this now? We know that, for example, apart from the fact that uh, we have uh, seven times more cultural events in the center and cultural institutions as well. This is important. You would think that uh, it's important to have events in the periphery as well. It's actually Muscovites don't really think that this is very well they're not very particular about cultural events they also think that shops and restaurants cafes are part of cultural activities cinema theater concerts for them that's a single group of cultural activities that's very varied but then in that case we also need a standard so in each neighborhood we have to have a standard for a socio-cultural life something that will bring people closer here throughout the city, but then if we have one standard for culture, we can't just put it right on top of another spatial standard. We have to have separate standards. Take a look at the, the photo over here. It's a standardized neighborhood. That's what we need. 
The next moment that's important, 36% of people in the center just drive, use transportation without a particular goal. So here's the thing, people mainly go to the center to meet up with other people. This means that um, people think that the center is different from the periphery. So in the center, that's what they consider a developed, normal, civilized area as opposed to the periphery. That's different for them. But what can we do so that we can you know, help people realize where they live? Well, for example, people live in certain neighborhoods for 10 years, 50 years, 5 years. If we're talking about gaps here, this is something else that I've thought that I thought about a lot when you were speaking. People have a memory of, of a place. They have spatial memory. For example, you can remember that there was a farm here. They used to grow, they had gardens here. They used to grow apples and different fruits. And then people built a new neighborhood. It's very large. The landscape here, the greenery, that's gardens in this area. Why gardens? Because for the reason I just said. And then they flower and they're beautiful and green. This will be appealing to future residents of this area who will be practicing gardening, for example, and landscaping. They also have uh, this river, the Raminka. We're talking about nature here. This is the Park Kapotnya. We call it an oil park at the Bureau because uh, underneath there's an oil pipe and on top you have this greenery. But nonetheless, around there's, fi there's tens of thousands of people who need to live here. So what we did, we uh, created a park that has cyclical forms of sports. You can run, you can jog, you can go for walks here. There's a roller drome, you can ski here in the winter. This is a unique place in that it's uh, located somewhere where people would have thought you wouldn't be able to live here. A, pe a lot of people live, uh, for example, on the Moscow Embankment. There's a lot of birds there. There's wildlife. The city is so different, so varied. We have to work in any conditions, in any situation, because of how varied it is. So over here, we have new lamps and street lights. We can make everything better. We can improve everything. Who benefits from this, actually, for the most part? Two more minutes. This is um, not very mobile groups. We're not talking uh, what well, we're talking about pensioners. We're talking about children. We're also talking about people with limited, with um, disabled people. Now let's talk about these peripheries. If someone wants to live in the periphery, then uh, there has to be something appealing about it. We need culture. We need history. We need the spatial memory. We need nature. We have uh, open format museums. I think that that would be really interesting. We can have cultural centers as well. Some things that, uh, for example, there's this theater on the southwest. Everyone goes there, despite it being in a different area. We can also have youth centers. We call them uh, youth factories. These are for social groups that people often forget about, teenagers and young people. What else do we need to do? We have uh, some orders and commissions now. We're, we need to um, improve retail and uh, malls because malls are dying worldwide. You can add a cinema to, uh, to a shopping center. So people will come to the shopping center, they'll go shopping, they'll go to the cinema, they'll spend their money there. This is a different way of life. We need to improve these malls so, so that we can implement these projects. We need another concept. We need to internalize that concept. We need to add education, culture, food, restaurants, food courts. And only once we have this will people come there and want to spend their money. And so a mall becomes 20% um, retail. The rest of it is a food court, 20%, and then culture, another 20%, 25%. So this is uh, how we can determine the main function of the center. It's actually got loads. We also need, uh, malls can also act as a place where residents of a neighborhood can come and meet up. So we need to not be angry about these things, but improve and work and develop. 
try to adapt for a new life. And so, in this case, we will not only have movement from the periphery to the center, we'll have movement from neighborhood to neighborhood between um, people who live in different neighborhoods and who are proud of their neighborhoods, periphery or center. Thank you very much. Alek. Now, so culture, communication, that'll save micro districts. Am I right? Yes, that's what it is. And then in conclusion, our discussion today, thank you very much for being so attentive to our session. I would like to ask Mr. Biryukov one more question. Today and yesterday at the forum, people have discussed Kapotnya, the neighborhood Kapotnya. Mr. Biryukov spoke about it, so did Mr. Shapiro, so did Mr. Sabanyan, the mayor, yesterday at the plenary. So we are starting to understand this is one of the pilot projects, pilot neighborhoods in this program that we have been discussing. Mr. Birikov, could you please tell me, when will you complete this pilot neighborhood project? When can we go there? When can we visit and take a look at it? Like we had excursions and visits for the My Streets project. Well, I'll continue what uh, Mr. Shapiro said. Neighbors will save Kapotnya. They'll go there. They'll r relax on the, on the 40 hectares of territory there. They'll rest on the uh, lake embankment on the river embankment they'll spend their time there this neighborhood will be fully improved towards the um set the anniversary of the city people can come on their ca uh, by car from different neighborhoods they can enjoy the moscow river they can walk along the banks they can play sports there's a cascade park there as well architects and um, designers and Constructors have worked on this. Regarding our other places, of uh, other locations at Kapunya, there's a hospital as well, continuing the construction on that for the next two years. But globally speaking, we will hand this neighborhood over to inhabitants and visitors of the city by the anniversary of the city. So, this will be, uh, we'll be working together with our. Uh, Collaborators will have, we've got, we've decreased uh, emissions in this area. The factory owners nearby, there's a an oil processing plant there. They've been making a lot of effort to make the air cleaner and more comfortable for inhabitants. Thank you very much, Mr. Mirikov. We see uh, there, there's the word stop being shown to us right now. I'd like to thank all of the participants of our discussion today. You've said a lot of very interesting things, voiced a lot of interesting ideas. Thank you. We hope that our neighborhoods will only continue to improve. Thank you very much.